if you get caught up in predicting human behavior, you're never going to actually do any business. So recognize that if you are focusing on the right things within your business and within the right markets, you're always going to have a certain level of success, regardless of where we are. All righty, guys. Welcome to the show. How's it going, Mason? Things are good. Uh, it's snowing, it's winter, and by the time this episode comes out, uh, it'll be ski season. So uh, going into the end of a weird but decent 2024. Today's also election day, actually, as we're Ooh. recording this episode, which I don't know if you were aware of that, Dan. Uh, I was, but I'm certain regardless of the outcome tomorrow, people will wake up and continue with their lives and still need housing. So I'm still doing business uh, and will continue doing business as I do every four years. Uh, so anything you want to say on that? Yeah, well, I, I think it's this funny thing where uh, people, uh, it feels like in 2024, have been sitting on the sidelines a little bit more uh, than I've seen in the past few years. And I think that especially coming into the end of the year, what people desire more than anything is just certainty, yeah. uh, regardless of any political affiliation or outcome. Uh, just knowing what's going to happen uh, gives people some sense of confidence because humans are just so afraid of the unknown, yeah. uh, which I think will um, play into some of the conversations we end up having today, actually. Yeah, so this is a fun one. So on our last newsletter, I wrote an article about Almost, I'm almost seven years in having started my business and done 250-ish deals, maybe a little more. Uh, so collectively, Mason and I have done well into the 400 plus deals. And so in that article, I wrote a synopsis of lessons learned, both tactical, you know, with dealing with other people, specific to deals, just some of the major takeaways from all of those transactions. And so this show is Mason and I going through a list of some of the most important rules of investing that both of us have established after, you know, 400 plus iterations. So that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, it's, it's funny trying to take lessons from every other area of life and consolidate them into one sentence, uh, snippets, but that, that's what we're going to do today. And we've got a lot written down, so we'll see how many we can get through and how many, uh, uh, hopefully resonate with each of you guys because it's not just about investing in the land business. Uh, it's about business in general and operations and hiring, firing, HR, leadership, everything kind of in between. So we hope you guys get a lot of value from this. So Dan, why don't you kick it off? Sounds good. So the first one I have, which is so appropriate right now, is timing the market. So I bought my first property at the beginning of 2018 and I started listening to real estate podcasts in 2017. And I almost didn't buy that first duplex because everybody was talking about the impending market crash. All the experienced gurus and people who had been in the business for decades said, oh, yeah, you know, we have gotten so overheated and prices are so high. There's a market crash coming. So I'm holding cash. This is 2017. Think of how ridiculous that is today. And it's been the same story over and over and over again. I've heard this nonstop. And the moral is not that real estate will go up forever. No, I'm sure there'll be ups and downs and fluctuations as there always have been, but you can't predict it. That's the point. And so participating starting now, starting today is the moral of, of this rule. So don't try and time the market. Absolutely. And I, I've got friends, you know, I graduated college in 2016 and everyone was just waiting on the next crash before they bought their house. And that was eight years ago. And it hasn't crashed. Even though 2024 was not a great year for home sales and the market hasn't been great, it's not like real estate prices have really tanked in any meaningful way compared to what they were in the late 2020s. And I think uh, I read a, an article this week on chaos theory and how it kind of applies to investing. And I think that it's very applicable where uh, humans have this intense desire to be able to predict things and we just can't because the economy is made up by human behavior and we are irrational beings. But yeah, when in an effort to keep things going and not just talk about one thing, uh, one of my first lessons that I have here is document every process of your business the first time you do it through video and convert it to text right away. So a little bit different uh, compared to the market analysis and prediction side of things, but 
just something that I really wish that I had done from the get-go, where getting started, uh, leaving a large corporate world and coming into the entrepreneurship world, I was so used to all of the standard operating procedures having been made and just living documents that we constantly edited as versus something that we created. What's so cool now is with all these AI tools, I mean, there's script AI where it records your screen and creates an SOP for you. You can use Loom or Screencast-O-Matic and all these different tools to record what you're doing. So inevitably, whenever you grow to the point where you're able to scale and hire employees, you have all of these training resources right there. And you, as an employee slash employer, as a solo entrepreneur, you have something to go back and reference as you get used to figuring out business uh, processes and practices. So that's definitely something I wish I had done from the get-go. Yeah, uh, that was a great summary. So I'll just agree with you and move on. So rule number three is competition always increases. It's not oversaturated. Um, I heard Pineda talking about this recently, and he used a baseball analogy. And I watched baseball when I was a kid. So growing up near Cleveland, I watched the Indians in the early 2000s. And I remember if somebody could throw upper 90s or over 100, that was crazy. That was rare. And I watched a little bit of the World Series. I, I couldn't believe how fast people were throwing uh, every pitch. And, of course, that was the World Series. But the standard has gotten higher, and I've seen this in everything. You know, I watched basketball as a kid. They rarely scare, scored over 100 points. You know, even early 2000s, LeBron on the Cavs, they rarely scare, scored over 100 points. Now they do all the time, and it's the same thing in business. So, yes, it's harder to get a deal inland right now or probably any real estate asset than it was five or six years ago. But number one, this is normal. Number two, it's going to continue that way. And five, ten years from now, we're going to say the same thing about today. And uh, uh, you can still get deals anyway. We just interviewed a guy a couple months ago that here in 2024 started a direct-to-seller business for houses in San Diego, California successfully this year. Wow. Talk about a competitive market that's oversaturated with nice real estate and he still did it. So competition increases, but so what? That's rule three. Agreed. Agreed. And too soon to start talking about baseball in the World Series, Dan. Uh, it was 15 <laughs> years uh, since I got to see the Yankees play. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my 2000 New York World Series pennant from whenever they won the Subway Series and the Yankees just got embarrassed in the World Series against the Dodgers. So I am still bitter about it and could probably spend the rest of the show talking about how bitter I am about it. But I think an important thing to recognize with what Dan's saying there is while the competition is increasing uh, because there's so much more access to knowledge, to tools, to systems that have made us more efficient as business owners, you have that same access to you have the access to everything as well. And so you can become just as good or better than your competition, uh, which which is really exciting uh, in the modern era. So yeah, I, I just, real quick, I got a comment on that, Macy. You know, I referenced a million times my older buddy that I learned a lot of my, my business from. And what he had to do in the 80s just to get an aggregated list of data was obscenely difficult. And it is so easy for me to sit here on my computer in San Diego and pull lists all over the country and send mailers. It is crazy how easy it is. So there is a pro and a con to everything. And yes, competition increases, but I can do this remotely from wherever I want. So that's awesome. So anyways, I'll pass it back to you. Guys. No, no, I, I, I think it's crucial. And I think um, one, one our, our fourth rule, which is kind of related to this, is whatever the most important function in your company is, outsource or delegate it last. I think this is a lesson that both Dan and I learned pretty early on where while Dan and I are both pretty decent at sales, uh, it's the most important function within our business. And I think um, I delegated it not exactly too early, but inappropriately. I don't think I had done enough deals before I had really uh, learned what the person was that I was looking for to fill that position and how to effectively manage that salesperson. Because regardless of the fact that I had managed dozens of employees with or dozens of direct reports with hundreds of employees under me, I'd never been a sales manager. And being a sales manager is far different than being an operations leader. And so I think that I personally needed to spend way more time in sales, which is the bread and butter. You can't make money in this business if you don't have a salesperson. Uh, and I should have 
delegated that last. There's so many other tasks that I still haven't fully delegated. And I know Dan's the same way with a lot of the administrative stuff that we get, you know, overburdened by. We throw tamper tantrums when we have to do certain things <laughs> and we like look at each other and we're like, damn it, dude, just, yeah. you know, hire someone to, else to do that job for you. And so I think that uh, those frustrating, unimportant tasks that aren't income generating, that's what you delegate first whatever the lifeblood of your business is, delegate it last until you have become an expert that you can effectively train someone. Yeah, agreed 100%. I made the same mistake. I outsourced acquisitions first. I don't think it was too soon, but I didn't oversee the employee enough. I didn't do enough call, uh, listening to her calls, coaching, training, that sort of thing. So agreed strongly in hindsight would have outsourced admin first or some sort of transaction coordination. Um, so my next rule is a corollary to what we were talking about, about, competition increases, right? I said there's good and there's bad at that because there's better technology for us, but there's more people doing it. And so rule number five is that everything has trade-offs. There's no free lunch. Uh, you know, Howard Marks, one of my favorite people to read memos by, he's a similar to Warren Buffett and what he does. He wrote uh, an article called Economic Reality and Political Reality. And he showed how these are always at odds. Right now it's the election. Trump and Kamala are promising the world with no cost, right? And so that's political reality, but economic reality says everything has a cost, right? And this is reality, uh, actual reality, I mean. And so this is true of everything. And so right now people are hoping that interest rates drop, that transaction volume picks back up. But remember 2020, 2021, and the first half of 2022, how difficult it was to buy anything, not even at a discount, but even at market price, because everything was going up every month right? Sure, stuff is moving, very easy to sell, but it's really hard to buy and vice versa. Right now, it's harder to sell, but it's the easiest to buy I've seen in a long time. There's deals on the market. There's distressed sellers, right? Same thing, you know, 2009 would have been really easy to buy discounted real estate, but you think the world's ending. Everyone thinks the world's ending. Everyone thinks real estate's worthless. Loans are hard to get, right? So there's always trade-offs in everything. And this is applicable across the board in life with everything. And so I think it's important to keep in mind, it's really the two sides of a coin, yin and yang sort of thing. So I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right on, Dan. I think uh, human behavior just in general is something that we really need to understand as business owners, because that's what dictates so much of this. Uh, and if you get caught up in predicting human behavior, you're never going to actually do any business. So recognize that if you are focusing on the right things within your business and within the right markets, you're always going to have a certain level of success regardless of where we are. So next uh, next lesson, uh, lesson number six here is bigger deals are not always better. I had my brain broken by my first ever land flip deal where I bought it for 43 and sold it for 185, you know, a few weeks later. And I thought that that's how every deal in this land business should go, um, where you triple your money and it doesn't take any time at all. And you don't do anything. You don't have to know anything about the property. And if it's not making six figures as a deal, you are a failure and you are dumb and you don't know how to run a land flipping business. Um, I have yet to do a deal as good as my first one. Um, with the same level of return, both on profitability and on margin, maybe one that had a similar uh, rate of return, but I made like three grand on a $1,000 purchase or something like that. So uh, I, I think that oftentimes whenever you're looking at the data and trying to create this, you know, 10X is easier than 1X idea, that's not necessarily the case within this business because with land specifically, where I have seen the most people have the most amount of su success is when you're focusing on a product where there is a huge quantity of end buyers that can come in and purchase that property instead of a very limited amount of end buyers. So uh, rather than focusing on bigger is better, focus more on the demand of the actual product, regardless of what the, the numbers are. Yeah, strongly agreed. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that. So I have on here, one of my headlines from that article was difficult, frustrating, boring. And guys, this is the reality of building any sort of business. I can go on and on with story after story from title companies not being able to close transactions on time to vendors 
contractors being problematic to just all the things that go wrong every single day in this business and in every business. Because I was having a conversation with one of my buddies who owns a lot of apartments and triple net buildings. And I said, wow, yeah, I, I don't think I want to buy any more residential units. I think I want to buy triple net. To which he went on a rant about all the things that go wrong with his triple net business and finished with, I just want to buy more apartments. So there's kind of several points I'm making here. So I'm kind of conflating several things. But first and foremost, it's that any business is going to have frustration and it's going to get boring. And the key to being successful is just sticking with something over the long term. Because I've already seen so many people who were making money fall off or get distracted because they saw the grass was greener somewhere else. And they were just unaware of the problems in other businesses. Whereas in my business, several hundred deals in, I've started to amass a decent net worth. I have a lot of freedom. And it's because I've just stuck with one thing that I've learned better than most people. And I'm going to continue doing that. So the moral of, of rule seven is business sucks most of the time and get used to it because that's just reality. But what it can create for you as far as freedom and, and, and freedom of choice over your day-to-day -day life and what you do is, is pretty awesome. But Dan, that's boring. And uh, <laughs> boring. That, that's the challenge that so many of us, uh, kind of the, the entrepreneur mindset, the sometimes, you know, direct correlation ADHD type mindset of there's so many shiny objects out there. And I think it leads into rule number eight pretty well, which is fine tune the system before expanding it. I think that uh, so often we focus on growth and scale and trying to do way, way, way more uh, before we've really gotten the practice down and um, are, have the ability to execute it really well. Uh, you and I um, both listened to that Alex Hormozzi podcast yesterday about uh, scaling. And I think one of the points that resonated with both of us, especially uh, with Dan and I doing some coaching and consulting in the space is people have a tendency to put the cart before the horse and they're focused on their, their hundredth deal before they've done one. Uh, they're focused on creating a foreign irrevocable trust that owns an S corp in the United States that manages an LLC for their 5,000th door rental property. And they've never gotten a lead or even owned their own primary residence. So what we're saying here is just get started and then get really good at the thing that you're getting started at and then worry about scaling and growth from there just by doing more of that exact same thing rather than uh, trying to, you know, create an insane growth model uh, for a business that you haven't really even started yet. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll leave that one at that. And and one of the rules I add on here was a correlation or a corollary to that. So I think is this number eight we're at or is this nine? That's nine. <clears throat> All right. So nine, I have positive procrastination. And here's an example. I like to work out and run and exercise. And so I use that as a means to procrastinate all the time. I would love to go run or go to the gym first thing in the morning, but I don't because I don't have to try to do those things. They're such ingrained habits. I have to sit down and do the shitty work that I don't want to do first thing in the morning, right? And so watch out for this. A lot of people use endless education, getting on support calls, reading books, listening to podcasts. I did as a means to procrastinate doing the uncomfortable thing that they need to do. So this is especially true with newbies. Uh, watch out for positive procrastination where you're doing things that are generally considered good and productive, but in your specific case, you're using them as a means to procrastinate. Absolutely. And I think that so many in this space uh, within, call it the real estate investing world, uh, have listened to more podcasts than imaginable, have read more books and uh, you would think they would be an expert and then you talk to them and it's they don't even understand the product that they're seeking out the business to invest in. Uh, and the only way to really, really learn anything is just by going out there and doing it. Um, so uh, positive procrastination is definitely a danger that a lot of us fall into. It's human behavior because it's scary because it's the unknown. Uh, but, you know, you can find a lot of low stakes opportunities to get involved. Uh, rule number 10 uh, kind of on the financial side of things is long-term debt is good, short-term debt is bad. And I think the most relatable example of this is, say you're buying your primary residence, get a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage 
don't try to do a, a, an arm or a really short mortgage where you think you're going to pay it off way earlier. Extend the debt out on anything that you're doing to the longest period of time, and then you can pay it off as early as you want. Uh, I think that with a lot of deals at the beginning of this business um, that I set up uh, with different land loans or promissory notes that I did, the timeline in my mind I thought was really long because of the biases that I had whenever the market was really hot. And I thought one year was a long term. Uh, one year is really, really short for a note. So I think that when you can, when you're seeking out debt, regardless of the business, the longer you can have the debt, uh, the better, because then you have the ability to focus on greater income generating activities or uh, pivoting the strategy with whatever individual deal it is to be able to pay it off sooner rather than later. Yeah, that is so important, Mason. That is probably one of the most important rules of this show. It's very, very simple, but it is the number one reason people go broke, I would say, in real estate, or maybe business in general, but I won't make that assertion. I'll say in real estate. Uh, so a lot of the lots we're buying are from failed developers that went broke originally. So uh, as a corollary to that, I want to talk about um, cash flow. Cash flow. Uh, I wish I could you know, talk to myself seven years ago about this, where it's always talked about on uh, real estate podcasts about making passive income and cash flow. Well, reality is if you have no net worth, and this is a rule number 11, if you have no net worth, stop trying to get cash flow. I was talking to one of my buddies yesterday who is a multi, multi, multi-millionaire, probably a decamillionaire, I'm not sure. And so he's more to a point where he wants to slow down and trade a lot of his wealth for cash flow, right? Triple net buildings, brand new construction, maybe be a, a contributor or a limited partner in people's syndications, that sort of thing, because he has a net worth to do that. If you're new and you're broke, you're not going to make passive cash flow. You need to go make active income first, right? That is the number one uh, thing you should be focusing on. Um, and you don't get cash flow until you have net worth to trade that for or trade into that, right? So anyways, that's my rant about cash flow. I have a corollary rule to that, but I'll, I'll pause for a moment. I think that's super important. And uh, Dan, you know, my rule right there to follow that is building a great balance sheet on paper doesn't pay the bills. And it's uh, something that I've personally experienced in this business where I look at my balance sheet and I'm like, okay, that's looking pretty good. You know, my personal net worth, the uh, the amount of uh, you know, liabilities versus equity in the company is looking really good. And then you look at your profit and loss statement and you're like, eh, I don't know if that looks as good as uh, my balance sheet. So my net worth is blah, blah amount of figures, but my profit and loss statement is like this roller coaster sine wave. And so I think that... Uh, with how much education there is out there, sometimes the desire where people hear a buzzword like accredited investor and they want to become one of those, uh, they focus on the net worth goal rather than the income goal, which there is an income goal associated with becoming an accredited investor, uh, that you really, once again, have a tendency to put the cart before the horse uh, because when your net worth looks a certain way, a lot of your rental properties, Dan, I know you get cash flow on them, but a lot of them are not enough to like just live off of like one door or one single family rental property. All it takes is one disaster to happen. And it's like, there goes the cash flow for the past year or two. Not to say it's a bad investment thesis by any means, but if your bills aren't covered or your personal expenses and your business expenses are not covered by either your job, whether it be W-2 or contract position or what your business does, uh, it doesn't really matter because a metric that a lot of large businesses use that I feel like a lot of small businesses neglect to use is days cash on hand, where if you are running at the current rate within your company and you don't have any additional income coming in, when are you going to run out of money? And if you look and you're like, okay, well, every two weeks I'm getting paid an extra $25,000, then your days cash on hand should start increasing because you're replenishing the coffers where we have an expression in the business. And it's what I feel a lot of times is feeling dirt rich and cash poor where it's like, look, all my net worth is in my land right now, uh, but it's all sitting on the market. So it creates opportunity, uh, but it doesn't necessarily create consistent cash flow, which is why what Dan is saying is so crucial. Make sure that your business produces cash on a 
weekly or monthly or quarterly basis that is enough to sustain your lifestyle, sustain your personal expenses, and sustain your business. Yeah. Yep. And, and to be clear, what I'm saying is when you're new, it's it's an you get that via an active business. You're not passively going to make cash flow when you have no net worth. And so, Mason, you did a nice uh, kind of lead into the next rule. So number 13, and this is also about cash flow, and it's simply with with small residential properties. So what the vast majority of us start with buying, you have no idea what your cash flow is going to be. Yes, you need to have a margin. You need to make some approximations. But it's like when I bought a couple fourplexes this year, I had someone comment, oh, what are these going to cash flow? Well, let's see. They needed rehab for about half the units. It was eight units total, two fourplexes. Uh, and then a number of tenants were turning over and wasn't sure where rents were going to fall because they're changing, they're fluctuating up and down. And you never know what's going to break. And so can I give you an average that might appear to be reality or turn out to be reality over the course of 20 to 30 years? Sure. Does that average manifest on any given year? No, it's ridiculous. For small residential buildings, unless it's new construction, you have absolutely no idea. You cannot predict it. You have to make approximations, but you need to already have reserves because it might hit you month two with a $10,000 expense. And this is, it leads to one of my favorite, I guess, aphorisms would be the word, beware of the six foot man who drowned crossing the river that was five foot deep on average, right? I'm taking that from Howard Marks, the guy I referenced earlier. He puts that in a lot of his memos because that concept is so important where averages are what you get over the long run when you get a regression to the mean. You do not get them in any sort of day-to-day. Uh, it, it doesn't manifest in the day-to-day. So uh, my point with rule number 13 is you don't know what your cash flow is uh, with small residential properties. Yep. It's all a prediction. And uh, humans are really bad at predicting things because there are just too many variables in the equation. And uh, which... Brings me to rule 14 here. If it feels sketchy, it probably is. Uh, There are a lot of people in this industry, there are a lot of people in this space that have unfortunately made a lot of money uh, by operating in the not most ethical ways possible. Uh, and, And with that being said, to actually not make it about ethics, I think a lot of times uh, assume ignorance over malice with a lot of the people that you're potentially working with. But regardless, I can't even tell you how many deals that, I mean, Dan and I get submitted to us that they're just horrible. They're, I mean, we, I reviewed one this morning that was submitted to us where it was a wholesale, they wanted to wholesale a piece of land to us that was worth maybe 60% of what they currently had it under contract for. They're putting irrelevant comps in all sorts of stuff like that. And a lot of people will have a justification for whatever number they're doing because there's that need or that scarcity mindset that's going on with their business and making the assumption that a lot of people will try to force a deal to pencil out uh, just because they need the cash more than anything and they see the opportunity. And once emotion gets involved, uh, they are going to have a really difficult time letting go. And then it comes across as sketchy to those of us in, in the industry that really understand what's going on and to people that don't understand what's going on they get bamboozled into uh, an opportunity that's just going to be a failure. Uh, With these people that you're working with, just recognize that you're going to have to vet them in some capacity and opportunities. If you're in this space, they are going to be abundant and plentiful. And whenever it feels way too good to be true, uh, it probably is as well. Yeah, uh, that's a great rule. If it feels too good to be true, it probably is. So, a um, good rule that relates to this is about partnerships that I have on here. There's a lot I can say on partnerships, but to kind of solidify it in a simple rule is one deal with new people. I just did my first build of a new contractor. Everything looked good. Friends had used them. It's a father-daughter team. Um, but no matter what, no matter how much I want to do multiple builds, one build to start. And it went great. So now we're going to do multiple. And this applies across the board you want to partner with someone, one deal with new people, just take my advice on this. And and Hermosi talked about this too on his 42 Rules of Money, which is a great episode. Um, that, I'll just leave it at that. It's it's really straightforward. I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I think that it, it's a really great rule of 
try and create an opportunity where the stakes are not so high that it's going to screw either partner over uh, within that. And typically a one simple deal type of thing uh, works where I think in business in general, neither you or I try to only do one pe- one deal with a person. Uh, mm-hmm. People are so complex where I'd rather work with just a few people and know them really well and trust them intimately and they prove themselves right. And it's like, okay, let's do it over and over again. Uh, and recognizing that a partnership is a two-way street and you have to provide b- value into that equation as well. And it's always tricky sometimes with new investors of whenever deals don't go the way you necessarily thought or wanted them to, um, which brings me to rule number 16 here of never lose an investor's money if you can't help it. And, uh, you know, deals are going to go south and that's going to happen sometimes. But if you can always pay your investors back and make sure that they don't lose money, that is going to keep your reputation up in whatever community that you're in. And I think that in in the long term, it's going to serve you way better, especially whenever there, I mean, there's going to be deals where you lose money on and your investors make money and it's painful and it hurts, but that right there creates a sense of loyalty that they'll tell their friends and uh, other people they work with of hope oh, Mason's a good guy to work with because even though the deal didn't go as planned, uh, he kept his promises. So I think that's a, an important one to, uh, to focus on at least whenever you start getting into the place where your business needs to take on investor capital to grow. Yeah, to that end, one of the rules I had, are we at 16? I don't know. I'm focused on what I'm saying, so I'm not angry. You're, you're, on, you're on 17. All right, I'm on 17. So rule number 17 is reputation over everything. Um, Mason's example of, of always paying back investors is a great example of that, but also that person that submitted to us a deal that mm, was pretty questionable as far as the comps. Everything was questionable about it. Maybe it was ignorance and not malice, like Mason said earlier. But if he wants to do business, I'm going to be more skeptical of him going forward. And we've had this before where people submit deals to us and they want to assign it and their comps are just absolute bullshit. I'm not going to do business with those people. And I'm going to be much harsher if anything were to come up. If they do have a good deal that I know and they want to assign it, I'm going to go out of my way to make sure they don't make very much money. Right. And so it's a small world. And keep the long term in mind and keep reputation I know, above all else uh, when when possible. Because, again, you're probably going to run into people multiple times. I deal with headache in, in a lot of the small markets I do business in. But there's such a small pool of realtors and attorneys and contractors that even if maybe the other person's at fault, I kind of eat it anyways because for the long term, it's worth it. So. Mason, anything you want to add to number 17? No, I think that my rule 18 expands on it, which is ensure anyone you work with, take investments from or hire, have incentives aligned with yours. Yeah. And it's tricky because you want to assume the best in people, uh, especially employees. And I think that's where this example can get really specific of, uh, with building a sales position and having a commission or compensation model, you need to really make sure that you build into that compensation model uh, an aligned incentive for every deal that that person is doing or that person is managing. Because um, you, while, while the example we brought up of where the investor makes money and you lose money, you don't want it to be so where your salespeople make money and you lose money as a business owner. And if you're not structuring your commission and compensation model correctly, uh, that can really happen. And I think that sometimes whenever they're not in total alignment with you as a business owner or as an organization, uh, you end up just paying for it and paying down the ignorant tax or ignorant debt uh, that you need to while building a sales organization. And it goes from investors too, uh, or partners where You don't want to work with people that only care about themselves because if you're working with someone that wants to create a longstanding partnership, you want everyone to win in the equation. And I think that's something that we try to really target with the investors we work with, the employees that we're hiring, the partners that we bring into businesses of making sure that, hey, you know, they're they're going to work with us for the long term. They want us to succeed just as badly as they want to succeed. Yeah, this was one of mine. So I've got to expand on this. The, The simple moral incentives drive 
human behavior, even if it's subconscious. I mean, I don't care if it's your best friend or your mom. This has a, a an impact, even if it's slight and, like I said, subconscious. And so I see this done wrong all the time, you know, in conjunction with everything Mason said. A couple other examples are cost plus with contractors. That's a terrible model because the more expensive it gets, the more they get paid. So if you do do that model, there's got to be a, a downside uh, mitigator for you where there's some sort of reduction or fee or something if they drive up the cost well beyond what they uh, uh, budget. Um, and property managers, the property manager I use in Pueblo, they only take a portion of revenue. They do not get a fee for placing people because if your property manager takes the first month rent and then only gets eight to 10% of subsequent months, you better believe they want turnover, even if it's not overt, even if they don't say it or mean it. And then that doesn't mean they're bad people. It's just, it's going to be there where, Hey, I get 10, a, uh, 10 months of income for every turnover. So you gotta, gotta align incentives with people or you're just bound to have problems. Again, even if the person is trustworthy, this will have a subconscious impact. So incentives drive human behavior. That's at the top of my list as far as rules from today. Yeah, agreed. And it's, uh, I think once again, kind of similar to the individual deal, it's something that you have to learn just by making mistakes with it uh, or learning from other people's mistakes and then following. Uh, a lot of times people have to learn it themselves, which is something that I feel like, uh, I don't know why, I don't know why that is of, we can't just experience someone else's pain empathetically enough to be like, okay, I don't need to learn that lesson. Thank you for teaching it, uh, to me, but switching gears a little bit within the, the lessons that we're talking about here. Uh, so lesson 20 is religiously track all of your data in every stage of your lead funnel. So often we'll hear uh, people in the various land investing communities or you know, mine and Dan's community on school or on Facebook groups talk about how uh, they're just not able to get any deals. And then you ask them, well, how many, how many mailers are you sending out? How many cold calls are you doing? How many texts are you sending? And these people are, they, they don't have a response or, well, I sent a hundred mailers six months ago. And if you really think about it of, if you have an idea of what your response rate is uh, for each stage in the lead funnel, then you're going to have a better idea of understanding whenever the sample size is actually large enough uh, to be able to get any sort of meaningful data where I saw in this Facebook group, someone said, well, I've been cold calling for the last four hours and don't have any leads. So I guess cold calling is not working, right? And it felt like a joke, but it wasn't. And it's this funny idea where there's times where I've sent 10,000 mailers and haven't gotten any responses and times where I've sent a few hundred mailers and gotten dozens and dozens of responses. So uh, recognize that it takes a large sample size to get meaningful data. And then whenever you have that meaningful data, you'll be able to understand that, okay, well, this market's more competitive, so it's going to take more marketing to get more leads, to get more deals, or you can figure out internally whether or not it's an issue uh, in the process of sales uh, or the process of lead generation uh, that might be causing any disparity uh, with actually getting deals to the finish line. Well said. Um, rule number 21 that I wanted to emphasize here is avoiding egometric, doing things, out, ego metrics or doing things out of ego. And the easiest example it drives me insane is when people say, how many doors do you have? What a stupid question. A door could be $50,000, could be 500000 could be a million dollars. It's little boys pulling out a ruler at a sleepover all over again. We're in our 20s. So uh, anyways, to avoid these sorts of metrics, how many deals have you done can sometimes be the same. I mean, there's uh, an experience and, and knowledge that comes from iteration, but at the end of the day, a deal might make you a thousand bucks. It might make you a million. And so it doesn't really tell you that much. Uh, doing subdivides just for the sake of saying you're doing subdivides or new construction. Avoid these incentives and doing things just for the sake of doing them. If it serves your business, great, but don't get caught up in that. You know, if you just want a, a, a retirement, maybe five nice houses paid off should be your goal, not 50 doors or 100 doors, right? So avoid arbitrary metrics that are just focused on ego. 100%, which I think leads into uh, a, a good rule number 22 here, which is don't take on a deal just because it's a good deal. 
If a deal will take you away from your primary business, don't do it. We've said it a few times in this episode, and we talk about it a lot. Shiny object syndrome is extremely real, and it's it's hard to get away from, but there are so many deals that are going to come into your inbox the more involved you get in the real estate investing world. And it uh, ends up just wasting your time and distracting you because you might not understand how that deal works or uh, it might not be real or it just isn't related to anything that you're actually doing. And then uh, going back to some of that positive procrastination where, oh, well, look at this opportunity. I'm going to go spend a bunch of time educating myself. So whenever deals like this come into my inbox, I'm going to be able to act on it and uh, actually make something happen. And what ends up happening is nothing because you get distracted by the next one and the next one and the next one. So focus on just one thing, get good at it. And then from there, you can start passively investing in other deal opportunities where uh, it's not taking away from what you're doing that's actually making you money. Yeah. And I want to expand on this because this is true with marketing too, where you know, I was listening to Ryan Dossie on a podcast recently. And you know, for anyone that doesn't know, his business is all about direct to seller marketing for housing houses, small multifamily, family, right? So very competitive in 2020, 2021, 22, very oversaturated, you know, pretty much any major, even, even minor Metro. And I remember him saying, well, I've been doing this for 10 years and mail is still making me money, getting me deals in all the markets. I'm in. And I see this right now with land where I've heard a number of the gurus and people who do third party marketing for land people. Oh, I'm not mailing anymore. We're not mailing. We're still getting deals via mail. It slowed down a bit, and the election probably has an effect on that. But the marketing channel isn't dead. The avatar is still very much the type that's reachable via mail. And the more that I hear other people slowing down, I'm thinking, well, shit, I should up my mail. So it applies with, with everything. When I want to add new marketing methods, I don't stop the ones that are working. I layer them on to test them. And so I, it's just it important in not just the business you're in and the deals you're doing, but the means of getting those deals. Make sure you don't uh, get shiny objects and them when it comes to your market. Totally agree. All right. Uh, next rule here is understand your product and all of the jargon associated with it, but be able to speak about it at a third grade level. And I think, uh, you know, it goes into if you can't teach someone about it, you probably don't know it really well. Uh, but more importantly, you really have to just understand the business that you're running and the business that you're operating. Uh, there are so many people that think that they can have a certain amount of success with wholesaling houses, and then they jump into land and think it's the exact same thing. And uh, it's just not. I mean, what what's astounding to me is talking with builders, and even builders don't really know very much about land, where if the land is not just perfectly shovel ready, ready to go, they don't know what to do with it. Uh, and so with any product that you're investing in being, being able to just understand, I mean, what a perk test is or what an ILC survey is, and just absolutely understanding the product that you are both buying and selling is going to be crucial for you to have success in whatever business you're doing, uh, or operating in, because if you don't, you're going to get burned. Yeah. I love to forget about the ILC as new construction finishing up and that causes a problem every time. So Thank you for that, Mason. Um, all right. I have on here for number 20-something, uh, whatever we're at, calmer heads prevail. You have a bunch of examples of this. So NAR settlement, right? It was big news. A lot of people I knew were freaking out. A lot of realtors hung up those licenses. People within the investing world were talking about how it was going to affect us. And here we are. Uh, what was it, July that it went into effect? So about four months, not quite, but about four months after it went into effect. And talking to my realtor friends, it has had little to no impact on anything at all. It's an extra piece of paperwork that agents want you to sign on the buy side. That's about it. Uh, and those people that freaked out and overreacted are, are many of them suffering because of that. Uh, there's a million examples of this. I was on a land investor call recently where everybody was talking about the new rule in Georgia where you have to put certain disclaimers on your marketing pieces to it's either people in Georgia or people who own land in Georgia. I think it's just anyone in Georgia. And so they're like, oh, well, I'm just going to take all Georgia addresses off our list. Every business, this is so normal. How many other businesses have disclaimers across the board on all their marketing pieces, right? And so that creates an opportunity in Georgia. Far fewer people are marketing to those people. I can go on and on and on. 
an easy example for, for me and a mistake I made is when 2022 I was doing most of my business in Pueblo West, Colorado, and they shut down all new water taps. And we didn't know when they were going to open them up. We didn't know if they were going to open them up. We didn't know at what price. And so long story short, I panicked. I sold off some land much lower than I should have. And four months later, land was trading again. They'd opened back up, albeit at a higher price, but it was it was still trading. And I sold way too low, way too quick because I freaked out. And some of my friends who were a bit calmer and more experienced didn't do that and benefited from that. So things change and calmer heads prevail. Don't make rational, irrational decisions just because a law or something is changing. Yep. And once again, humans are irrational and uh, recognizing that a majority of the population is going to be irrational in a response to whatever it is uh, means that if you can be the calm one in the equation, then you can uh, typically prevail, which is, which is the goal. Uh, sort of in relation to it is a rule, I think we're at 26 now, align your marketing method with your customer avatar. Uh, in this business, whether it's working with land sellers, working with land buyers or builders or investors, make sure the product that you're offering uh, through whatever marketing medium it is, is in alignment with who that customer is. Uh, the person that owns one property in rural Colorado and lives in Texas is going to be a very different person typically than the person that owns 200 lots that are totally finished, uh, ready to go vertical on construction in Florida, where if you're doing this ridiculous pawn shop advertising of, you know, that we buy land for cash, you know, cash, 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 quick cash, uh, to the person that owns 200 lots and has been working in land for 30 years, they're probably going to throw it right in the garbage uh, as versus uh, having a more sophisticated, uh, more, I guess, commonly accepted terminology within the land business uh, to know that they're a sophisticated seller and that um, they're going to respond to something that comes across as more professional rather than a pawn shop, I think is important and is always going to get you more leads to close more deals in your business. Yeah, agreed strongly. We could do a whole podcast on targeting your seller avatar because it's done so improperly in land oftentimes. But moving on, uh, rule 26, and it's a question to kind of allude to the rule. Do you want to be right or do you want to make money? Uh, and this this kind of correlates with what I said earlier about small towns and being able to work with people consistently because they're your only option. And so let me give you an example. Last week, the engineer I use for foundations on the new builds I do in Colorado sent over the plans to my contractor and I don't even look at them normally they just go to my contractor I get a text from her very early in the morning call me we have a problem great wonderful he did the wrong plans for the wrong building he did the same building I had just built the duplex I checked my emails they were totally unambiguous I said we're doing a single family home please see attached for the single family home plans and yet he did a duplex I had to call him and I'd love to say, you're an idiot. What the fuck is this? You know, but I didn't. Instead, I empathized with him as he tried to shift responsibility off himself. And I did what I had to do to keep him calm and to just get the plans done. Because at this point, we just need them, right? So we don't miss the deadline and get pushed into not being able to break ground and get the permit until next year. Because he's very affordable and I want to be able to use him again. And so... I kind of just had to eat the fact that this idiot can't read an email and also didn't really want to take responsibility for his inability to read. There was, again, absolutely no ambiguity. I looked at all the communication. This guy just didn't read it. 100% his fault. And this is sort of thing is going to happen all the time, especially with title companies and attorneys handling escrow, where they're totally in the wrong and you can't say that because it's not productive. It's not going to get you what you want. I think one of the best examples, I haven't had to do this, thankfully. I don't think Mason has either, but Hermosi was talking about where he got sued and his attorney's like, do you want to be right or do you want the, the cheapest solution? It's going to cost you more to show that this person is wrong than it is to just settle with them and move on. And that's probably the ultimate example because, right, that hurts, right? You don't want to do that. This person's wrong, but that's the reality of business. So do you want to be right or do you want to make money? Oh, yeah. And ego is at play with everyone involved. And when you can remove your own ego from the conversation, it's going to make your life a lot easier. 
So next rule, 27-ish, 28-ish, we've stopped kind of keeping uh, accurate count is everyone has something to teach you, but don't take financial advice from your broke friends. And I think this can apply to beyond just financial advice. Uh, It can apply to real estate and land and houses and single families and duplexes. It's all these people that think they're an expert in everything because they read a book or listened to a podcast or they had a friend tell them, uh, you're going to run into this with sellers that say, oh, their land is worth this much. And, you know, you, you can, for sales tip advice, just ask them, oh, where did you get that number from? It's like, oh, my cousin's friend is a realtor that told me, oh, okay, in what state? And uh, it, it, it's funny kind of how that works where um, those people that have a tendency to just give way too much advice all the time, uh, we, we say as we're uh, creating an episode just about giving advice, um, might be the ones that are constantly on the next thing of they're doing crypto and then they're doing uh, notes and then they're doing this and that and the other thing. But look at the track record of the person that you're taking advice from and make sure that they have some experience from it. And kind of on the flip side of that, recognize that even though they might not know what they're doing, you can still listen to someone. Uh, sometimes people are going to have a different way of thinking about things and a different approach and that their background life experience might give you a different idea um, how to do it. So assume you can learn something from anyone, uh, but don't take financial advice from your broke friends. Or they might be an idiot and they might not know anything, but Mason's more of a, a little more idealistic than I am. Um, so anyways, moving on to uh, late 20s, maybe 28-ish, we'll call, we'll call it 28. Um Hold nice properties, hold nice properties. And so speaking specifically to buy and hold, I just have found that this is not discussed enough when people are looking at markets and doing analysis and where they can make money, where they should be investing. Of course, they look at growth as you should, you know, population growth, job growth. They look at rent to price ratio, all that sort of thing. But I don't think enough attention is given to not just nice in the sense of the neighborhood, but nice and how new is it? If you buy a building that was built in 96 versus, you know, going back to near Cleveland where I'm from and all these properties that are 100 or 80 years old, they are such a pain in the ass. And this is not given enough uh, attention and consideration, right? At this point, you guys have probably heard me say it before, but I want buildings that are younger than me in areas where I can get tenants with 700 or better credit scores. I would much rather buy something at market value that is going to get me exceptional tenants and was built, you know, again, younger than me. So I was born in 96. Uh, then I would a great deal on a piece of shit in a C neighborhood in Cleveland. Uh, I just, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Having done this now for years, I have 26 tenants. I have a decent amount of rentals. Buy nice buildings. You know, Barbara Corcoran always says for anyone that's listened to her, she'll overpay for prime real estate that she's going to hold for decades. And I agree with that at this point. So, just learn from my mistakes. And even if it looks good on paper, watch out for rough areas and old real estate. Yep. I can attest to that where my first uh, rental property that I bought for an investment was built over 50 years ago, which comes with it, its own challenges. Uh, but it initially thought it was going to be a lipstick on a pig project and turned into a full gut rehab from not quite out of state, but almost out of state, uh, which has been a big pain. And I've put enough money into it uh, to have purchased um, several nice brand new duplexes in good markets uh, with very conventional financing. So you live and you learn. Um, And on that, I think, uh, let's call it rule uh, 30-ish. And maybe that's the title of this episode is (laughs) 30-ish rules for investing. Uh, and owning businesses or something like that. But don't forget that everything takes much longer than it feels like it should. I think that uh, for for both Dan and I, where um, we're both in our 20s, or I'm still in my 20s for at least another couple of weeks. By the time this comes out, I'll probably be 30. Um, and, uh, and an old, old man. And in this hustle culture, in this real estate entrepreneur world where there's a tremendous amount of ego at play, and people talk about how they went from zero to a thousand doors in, you know, sixty days, and how they're doing all this crazy stuff. A lot of it is a lie. A lot of it is fraud. A lot of it is not real. Um, building a large company, 
uh, and creating a large real estate portfolio, um, becoming successful takes way, way, way longer uh, than people make it out to be. It takes years and years and decades uh, to become really truly successful, uh, creating cash flow businesses, creating a huge balance sheet and personal and business net worth. Uh, and I think that sometimes it's just useful to re remind yourself that, you know, you're not going to just figure it out right away where you might have a great first year an okay second year, a crappy third year, crappy fourth year and an amazing fifth year. And being able to overcome those challenges that you're going to run into uh, as you're creating and building a business is what's going to allow you to continue on. Because most people, as soon as they hit any sort of challenge or hurdle, they're just going to stop and give up and go back to whatever it is that they were doing before. Uh, and I think that that creates a lot of self-limiting beliefs and forces people to give up before they were going to hit that really next successful stride. Yeah, this is so important. I could do, I could talk about this alone for 30 minutes. We'll call this, I'm going to do a corollary rule here about thinking long term. We'll call it rule 30 because Mason's turning 30 and is now middle-aged. No, I'm kidding. 30 is very young. Thanks. <laughs> I, I'm I'm right behind you, so soon enough. But no, th this is so true. Where I heard all those podcasts where I was starting about people just accruing a tremendous amount of doors, right, or just a huge net worth in a short time, and it's generally not realistic. Yet, what you can do in a decade is pretty powerful. You know, I'm coming up on seven years and three more years at this rate, and at you know I'll be 31 and 10 years in, I'll be in a pretty damn good place unless I really mess up these next few years. And so try and start thinking long term from day one and you will make much better decisions. You'll you'll be in a much better place five to 10 years in if you're not stuck on a cycle of thinking of 30, 60, 90 days ahead all the time. And if you step back and think, well, what decisions would I be very happy that I made five, 10, 20 years from now? And so I've moved to thinking that way, but I wish I would have started sooner. I would have made better decisions and I would be further ahead right now if I'd done that. So in all your planning and all your thinking, you know, of course you have to eat next week, next month, but as soon as you're able to get that covered where you can step back and think, think about how would I be making decisions if, uh, uh, you know, I want to be a decamillionaire in 10 years or a millionaire in 10 years, whatever it might be. And I think you'll make better decisions and just have a more realistic expectation. If I was starting today or if I was talking to someone that's young, or screw it. Maybe you're 40. Who cares? A lot of people are broke their whole life. So maybe you're 40 and you're just starting. Well, what decisions would you make today if you want to be a millionaire by 50 or worth $5 million by 50? You'll make much better decisions. Agreed. And it goes back to one of our earlier, earlier rules, just talking about creating cash flow for yourself. And that can be a W-2 job or a 1099 job or a side hustle job in addition to whatever real estate business that you're creating. Because if you can't get into that focus space to be able to think about the long term, uh, it's going to be really hard to build that net worth where if if you can figure out cash flow, that's the hardest part of this a lot of the times of if you figure out cash flow and can save money, then it becomes a really simple investment thesis of, okay, every six months, I'm going to buy a single family house until I can start buying a duplex. And then I can trade up and do all that stuff. And a decade later, you're going to look back and be like, wow, that was incredible. Because with real estate and with most assets that you're acquiring, the best time to buy is either today or 10 years ago. And uh, people forget that and think that they missed out and you know, think that when prices went way up in 2021 and 2022, that, you know, they're, they, like it, everything is going to be unaffordable forever and markets change, but over the long, long, long term, uh, assets are going to appreciate. You're going to be really grateful for the decisions that you made today that are impacting yourself in 10, 20, 30, or 40 years. So Dan, with us hitting 30-ish lessons, uh, are there any extras or bonuses that you want to uh, add on to this or if not yeah, maybe take us yeah there, there's a couple i would love to hit on i know this is going long guys but these are really important one that you had on your list that is applicable to what i just said about thinking long term i forget where or how you phrased it but always have more cash on hand than you think you need have reserves you know we just interviewed Pineda in vegas and 
He talked about how his flipping company experienced challenges these last few years when interest rates doubled. And the only reason he survived was because he had cash reserves. And this also allows you to think longer term because you're not worried about tomorrow. If you have a year of cash on hand, right, you can sit back and plan and it doesn't matter um, if deals close tomorrow or it takes three months to sell or four months, you can make better decisions negotiating. I just, it is worth having that money around, even though that money is just deteriorating because of inflation, because you'll be able to make such better decisions. Absolutely. And I mean, going back to saying, uh, you know, being dirt rich and cash poor, uh, cash is king and it really always will be king because uh, the amount of opportunities that get passed up on and not in the sense of just trying to get the shiny object syndrome or anything like that, but deals that are in the pipeline that uh, make absolute sense to do because, you know, cash reserves might be low that you pass up on because because they're low. Uh ends up losing you a lot of money and mm -hmm. opportunity cost lost is a tricky metric to ever get too held up on because uh, it's it can be defeating but absolutely um, being able to always feel comfortable personally and within your business and having a huge cash reserve will always uh, trump anything else and then never letting that cash reserve get too low because what happens is that entrepreneurial life cycle of you buy a bunch and you feel poor and then you sell a bunch and you feel rich and then you're like, I'm never doing that again. And then a bunch of opportunities come. So, uh, you know, don't over leverage yourself. I have three more quick rules I'll throw out there. Just, all right, your tenants are your customers. Treat them as such. I don't know why it's not thought of this way. And it's often a confrontational dynamic. I have mostly property managers, but I have a few rentals. I still just manage myself. And I have had such a good experience overall, having done this since 2018, because I've treated tenants really, really well. Now I screen them hard on the front end, but then I reciprocate and treat them well, take care of them, help them. And I have not, much of the horror story you hear around tenant problems, I have not dealt with. I'm sure I will here and there, it's inevitable, but overall it's been a great dynamic with great people. So your tenants or your customers treat them as such. Did you want to say something or should I just keep fun? No, I, I have another one here on my list uh, as okay. well of find a mentor or coach that has lost money before. Yes. If they haven't, they're lying or they haven't done enough business yet. I think that uh, just just once again, of ego comes into these conversations and within this world so often that people will be like, oh, I've never lost money on a deal before. or uh, and, and then you really get into it and you try and talk about any deals that have gone south and you learn, oh, they've only done two deals. Why are they mentoring? Or, oh, they have actually spent a ton of money to get these deals that they haven't lost money on. So their business is losing money, even if on a deal by deal basis, those deals aren't losing money. So um, whatever it is, it's better a lot of times, even though, uh, I mean, Dan and I have mentors that have done lots and lots that it's great to find the, the gray beard is what a lot of people call it of someone that has the gray hair uh, that has gone through it. They might not know all the tech and all the crazy jargon and stuff like that, that we can use but they understand business and they understand the product uh, that you're working in. And uh, I guarantee you they've, they've scraped their knees along the way. And uh, they're the people that you want to learn from, not the person that allegedly has only made money every year for the past six months. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, to, to that end, I, I find a very consistent, everyone I know is very wealthy. You don't know it by how they dress, what they drive. They're calm. They're quiet. Just a kind of a, a a calm, quiet confidence to them when people are boisterous or bragging or telling you, they got to tell you about all the success. That's a huge red flag that they're full of shit. So anyways, two more that I have are uh, two sides of the, the same coin, really. I have never stopped marketing. I think this would be 33 or 34. And guys, for our businesses, if you're a realtor, land investor, house flipper, you are screwing yourself 90 or 180 days from now. Never stop marketing. If you're running out of money, start cold call. Whatever you have to do, always keep marketing. And then to that end, uh, lead measures are all that matters. And what I mean here is this is really for the people that are new to being self-employed and are coming from the world of, of W-2, where you're a W-2 employee, you have tasks to do, you have, oh, I have to be here for eight hours and I get paid. Well, that is not the reality in owning a business. You have to do the right tasks or 
you don't make money. And so when I look at my day, ca- my calendar and the work I'm doing every week, I have lead measures, sending mail, coaching my guys, that sort of thing that lead to making money. And those are the only things that I count in my head is work. Me responding to transactional emails or admin, that doesn't count. I don't get to count that because I don't just get paid for showing up or for being here for eight hours like you do as a job. The only thing that will make me money ultimately are those lead measures. So number one, be clear on those. But number two, those are all that matter. Nobody cares if you spent eight hours dealing with the headache that was just admin because that's not going to make you money. If you're not doing and hitting your lead measures, you will go broke and you will not have a business. And so just getting in that mindset is really important if you want to be self Absolutely. And it goes back to one of the earlier rules of it's difficult and frustrating and really boring. And that being said, it's consistency is that that trumps all within this. And you're going to be so upset at yourself whenever you realize that, hey, things finally moved, all these properties finally sold, I have all this cash and everything. And then you look at your pipeline and you don't have anything to do. You don't have any you know, work uh, to work on from the lack of work that you didn't or the lack of work that you did uh, whenever you were sitting around stressed out about whatever. And that's something really, really, really hard to do. It's really hard to keep marketing and spending money on marketing and focusing on lead gen whenever stuff is not necessarily going the right way. And we're not necessarily suggesting that you go underwater or anything like that to keep paying for the most expensive form of marketing. Pick up the phone, cold call. Uh, you can pull a list of thousands and thousands of phone numbers uh, that does not cost very much money, that is way, way, way cheaper than mail. Uh, but what you sacrifice for in convenience um, and spending money, you pay for with your time. And that's okay because what else are you doing? Um, you know, time is the thing that is uh, the most scarce resource that you're going to have. But if uh, you aren't getting leads, you're not going to have a business, uh, no matter really what what it is. But Dan, I think that, um, you know, we did 30-ish plus a handful of extra um, important but bonus ones. And now I ask you, again, uh, any other last minute thoughts you want to leave the audience with or uh, do you want to wrap things up? Yeah, I I think it's time to wrap things up, guys. I'd say really the biggest thing uh, or way to summarize most of what we talked about is picking one thing, getting really good at it, doing it for decades and doing business with good people. Uh, that's the moral of most of what we said. So I hope this was helpful, guys. Much of this is stuff Mason and I wish we could share with ourselves six, five, six seven years ago. Uh, but for now, that's all. Uh, this is the Big Picture Blueprint. Dan Habercost and Mason McDonald signing off. Mm-hmm.